There are certain artists who either by dint of their personality or the weight of their talent form the headwaters of the rivers of the many musics that contribute to the great ocean that is the Western pop rock atom. Artists such as Louis Armstrong, Prince Buster, Elvis Presley, Bill Monroe, James Brown, Jimi Hendrix, all stand as emblematic of their particular musics. They're not necessarily the original practitioners, they're not necessarily the best practitioners, but they're the ones through whom the influences flowed and the music as we know it was created. In the case of country music, there's one artist who was such a profound influence that they earned the abiding title of the father of country music. This is the Righteous Bo Jambo, and it's time to talk about Jimmy Rogers. Born in Meridian in central Mississippi in 1897, as we measure things hereabouts around 160 miles from where the Southern Cross is the Yellow Dog, Rogers lost his mother at a young age and developed a passion for the wide open road through travelling between various relatives. Meridian was not the picture of rural poverty we romantically associate as the birthplace of folksy American musical forms or unfairly ascribed to postbellum Mississippi. It was a bustling, prosperous town, a busy railroad hub with finer appointments in most cities in Mississippi, libraries, department stores, an opera house, and a pro baseball team. His musical proclivities were obvious by the age of nine, whereupon he'd started soaking up the regional blues, hill music, cowboy tunes, and music he heard in passing circuses and carnivals. By the time he was 13, he'd run away from home not once, but twice, to organize touring shows amongst local musicians, both times to be hauled home by his father, who was a railway worker. His father found him a job on the railways toting water, and that saw him first exposed to field chants and hollows from the African-American workers and the Gandhi dancers, who were both coloured and white railway workers who used song to coordinate lifting and hitting activities, which further informed his prodigious musical imagination. Later he worked on the New Orleans and Northeastern Railroad, which exposed him to jazz and the unique rhythms of New Orleans blues and primitive zydecos. Whatever Rogers heard, no matter how or where he heard it, he filed away. However, in 1924, he was diagnosed with tuberculosis and lost his railway job. Making lemonade out of this particular lemon, however, he promptly organized another very successful traveling show, but was forced to abandon it when a hurricane destroyed the traveling company's tent. It's April 1927 when we next encounter Rogers in Asheville, North Carolina, in a four-piece string band very much in the Charlie Poole mode, hosting a radio show as the Jimmy Rogers Entertainers. In July, completely on spec, he and his group, under their original name, the Teneva Ramblers, headed to Bristol, Tennessee to participate in what became the legendary Ralph Pierce Sessions. These sessions, which Johnny Cash described as the big bang that started country music, which is odd, because one would have thought Johnny Cash was a creationist, but who knows, were the point where country music became a clear commercial identity, as opposed to the niche market of hillbilly music, and along with the Carter family, Rogers was the most important and successful find of the 12 days recording that took place. But it very nearly didn't happen. The night before they were due to record, which was the 3rd of August 1927, the band had a terrible fight and basically threw Rogers out, rescheduling their recording for the 4th of August. Rogers, however, did likewise and booked the first slot of the date, recording The Soldier's Sweetheart and Sleep Baby Sleep, both of which were released to moderate success. Emboldened by his triumph, Rogers travelled to New York seeking to do more recording with Pia, having now added a unique selling point to his musical repertoire, a yodel taught to him by Swiss Calvinist missionaries in a church in Mississippi, 
which linked his southern blues style to the cowboy ballads which were then emerging as popular. He was promptly dispatched to Victor's City Within a City in Camden, New Jersey to record the classic Tea for Texas, which sold half a million copies and over the next five years he produced a further 109 songs, or 108 if you don't count the exploitation disc Rogers puzzle song, which surpassed the feats of Charlie Poole and established Rogers as the first genuine nationwide star to be created primarily through the sales of his recordings. Most remarkable of these recordings was probably Blue Yodel No. 9, recorded in Los Angeles and featuring an uncredited Louis Armstrong and Lil Harden, who was also Mrs. Louis Armstrong, on trumpet and piano respectively. Here we have the most famous country singer in the world meeting the most famous blues musician in the world, in a mix of black and white music that the easy narrative would have us believe didn't happen until 1954 in, of all places, Memphis. Blue Yodel No. 9's story takes place in Memphis as well. Rogers was possessed of three great gifts that really built his recorded legacy. He had a simple, straightforward voice in a form which used to be valued above all in its singers, and that was the quality of sincerity, which seems to have all but disappeared these days in country singers, replaced by wanting every singer to sound like a talent show contestant, bland, similar, and possessed of a few party pieces such as a wobbly and overdone melisma. He had fantastic timing for a singer, and his arrangements were always interesting, especially on Blue Yodel No. 9. Relaxed, but with a great sense of swing, and he was a tremendous lyricist, a master of what's called the floating lyric, where the song's narrative is assembled from found images and snatches of language from either common tongue or folk language. Listen to Blue Jodel No. 11, how he turns it to wryly humorous effect, or No Hard Times, where what could be seen as a mishmash of doggerel and blues cliches sees him emerged defiant and optimistic in the face of the depression. Add to this, once the audience has saw him live as he toured extensively, this added to the hysteria around his fan base. He was known as a man of unfailing loyalty and good humor, retaining friendships with early bandmates and people from Meridian all his life. He was well known for his charity work, the peak of his fame. He made a gratis tour of the Midwest with Will Rogers to raise funds for the Red Cross. He had a habit of just turning up on street corners or at soup kitchens and playing impromptu gigs. And he had an unstinting willingness to socialize with fans after shows. But exacerbated by his grueling touring and recording schedule, TB had done for Rogers by 1932. He ostensibly retired from touring, moved to Texas with his wife Carrie, who he couldn't stand, and who later went on to sponsor Ernest Tubbs' early career, and took a job hosting a radio show in San Antonio. But Jimmy was a rambling man, and he made several furtive attempts to get back on the road, only for TB to beat him back each time. In something of a depressed state and pitifully short on money, knowing he'd never get the chance to be out and meet his beloved fans again, he made what he must have known would be his last trip to New York City, to the same studio where Elvis Presley would cut Hound Dog some 23 years later, for one final bout of recording sessions in May 1933. He struggled through six songs despite Victor hiring two session musicians and a nurse to help him out and is having to rest on a cot between takes. Ralph Peer, meanwhile, had negotiated a new contract for Rogers which got him top dollar for the sides he was recording and cash on the barrel head up front and stipulated that Victor must never destroy any of Rogers' master tapes, all the while withholding Rogers' desperate condition from the suits. They signed the contract. But it was all too much and too late for brave Jimmy Rogers. And on May 26, he slipped from the bounds of this earth in his bed at the Tuft Hotel, aged just 35. His body was shipped home to Meridian, where he was buried in a local cemetery. A man of the people who had shared the travails of the working man and fully known to his audience, worked with the dark shadow and pain of an incurable sickness. Rogers was not above peccadilloes. 
He did love the high life and when not affecting his singing brakeman persona, he dressed smartly and loved powerful cars. And he openly shared this fact with his audience who readily accepted the dichotomy of the working man who'd made his fortune and was unashamed to spend it. They would if they could, and Rogers was a symbol of aspiration for a better life after hard times. He was, however, a heavy gambler who heavy threw away more than one, one fortune in the card parlours of, of, of Louisiana, playing poker and playing hearts. Poker and hearts. His voice, with that warm sincerity, had them believe the sentimental or roughhouse songs he sang, as if they were sung from his own life and experience. At the time of his death, he still accounted for 10% of Victor's total sales, at a time when Victor was probably the biggest and most powerful recording company in the world. At the risk of perpetuating the great man narrative in popular music, Rogers casts an immense and abiding shadow over the classic canon. Not only country music, but the blues as well. He was, for example, Howlin' Wolf's favourite singer. And Wolf says he got his trademark vocal style from trying to impersonate Rogers' yodel. I couldn't do no yodeling, he said, so I tried howling. That done all right by me. Not only was Rogers an inaugural inductee into the Country Music Hall of Fame, he was also an inaugural inductee into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a blues influence, despite dying 16 years before any of his fellow inaugural inductees made their first record. For his first two hits, Hank Williams was to feature a Rogers-style yodel prominently, those hits being Lovesick Blues and Moaning the Blues. His influence and charisma is so abiding that Bob Dylan decided to entitle his latest album, 60 Years Into The Game, after a Jimmy Rogers song. And further, and most amazingly, there's a tribe in Kenya which, when exposed to Rogers' music during World War II, was so impressed by his yodeling, they modelled him as a minor deity, picturing him as a half-man, half-antelope trickster and writing their own yodel songs in his honour. The real key to the greatness of Jimmy Rogers lies in the fact that he was the first modern American singer. The first one to fuse all of the styles available to him. Pop songs, blues songs, cowboy ballads, country songs, patriotic songs, sentimental ballads about home and mother. Rogers had the full repertoire. He was also a great actor through his songs. He could be anyone that he needed to be in the song. Hero, bum, grifter, victim, cop, patriot, you name it. That was Jimmy Rogers. And that was the template for all of the great interpretive singers in any genre thereafter. Please. If you want to understand one of the bases from which modern popular music launched, have a listen to the playlist referenced in the video and hear for yourself how Jimmy Rogers became the father of country music. Hopefully, you'll agree with the conclusions that I came to many years ago, that Jimmy Rogers had done it all before anyone had done anything.